The name of the people being interviewed today is Mr. Bruce Bryan and Mrs. Marjorie Bryan. My name is Emily Bailey, the interviewer from Eastern Michigan University. The name of the cameraman is Andrew Green. We are interviewing in Allen Park, Michigan. Uh, the veterans uh, branches of service, Mr. Bryan was in the Army Air Corps and was a captain in Italy. Mrs. Bryan was in the WAAC and was a tech sergeant in the States and also in France. Well, I, I was a captain after Italy, so in Italy I was the first captain. I didn't get my sergeant until... Uh, well, at the end, at the oh, end. Okay. Um, first question, uh, Mr. Bryan, where were you born and raised? Oh, in 1920. Okay. And same question, where were you raised? Independence, Mississippi. Okay. That's Tate County. Independence is just a little crossroad. Can you tell what you, tell me what your family life was like growing up? Well, it's pretty good, I guess. <laughs> I, my mother died when I was 12, and my dad and I kind of backed her on, and I lived with relatives a lot. So. But I had a good, good relationship with my family and uh, a lot of friends out there. Same thing, your family Same life? Same thing. I'm the oldest of four children, and um, when I went through high school, it was during the Depression. I would have liked to have gone to college, but I just couldn't afford it. <laughs> Before the war, Mr. Bryan, were you thinking um, military was for you, or what was your plans for your future? I really didn't have any, but I always wanted to be a flyer. My dad used to do work for the old barn store versus World War I, so I was kind of an airplane nut since I was big enough to stand up. I, was, I remember flying in airplanes when I was, before I got into grade school. Same thing. Did you plan on joining the military? No, not until the war came along and there weren't any services for women up until May of uh, 42 after the war started. In 41 and did, and they made it begin to they were, well well uh, Arnold was the first to have the women and then uh, Navy and the Air, a Marine were the last I think to take women yeah. to take the women. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me what you were doing when Pearl Harbor was bombed? I was sleeping in my bunk in Philadelphia, Illinois. <laughs> and what was your reaction when you found out? We didn't know if. Panic in the streets. Everybody's running around. I thought the Japs were right outside the gate, but they weren't. So. Okay, where were you when Pearl Harbor was bombed? Chinook Field, Illinois. Okay. And what about you? What I was were in you Army doing? Then. What were you doing when Pearl Harbor was bombed? I was working in Memphis, Tennessee, and my mother was in the hospital, and, and I lived with an uncle and some cousins, and my dad and sisters had come to Memphis to visit my mother that day. She was in the hospital, and. Well, I guess on Sunday morning that the radio began to tell about it. And do you remember your reaction, how you felt? Well, everyone was stunned, I guess, and though I think we kind of thought there would be a war. Well, we were going to be in the war. We knew that in 39, just a question of time. Well, the bombing of Pearl Harbor was what? stunned most of us, I think, because nearly all, someone that I went to school with was there at the time. And my family heard that he was one that was killed, but he wasn't later. From the time that um, Pearl Harbor was bombed, how long until you went overseas? No, oh, I didn't go overseas until 1944. I was in the enlisted men at Chinook Field and going through the mechanic school there. And then I went to the Institute Special School, then they made me an instructor there, and then I moved down to Seymour Johnson Field in the Carolinas. I couldn't get in flying because I was underweight, and I like, never got a waiver. I'm 14 pounds under for my height, and I finally got a waiver to get in the Corps of Cadets as pilot training. In the years that you were training, Pardon? And, and during the years you were training to, to go overseas, did you know when you were going to go? No. You were just waiting. Nobody knows where they're going to go. You go where they tell you, you know. <laughs> and what about you? What were you doing from Pearl Harbor until you were deployed? Well, I kept working, and I kept, when they read about the Women's Army Auxiliary, I kept saying I was going to join it, and of course, no one thought I would. 
tell you the truth, I didn't want me to. So what was the what was the pushing force to make you? I just wanted to. I was 21 years old. I was 22. In fact, you had to be 21, and I didn't have to ask my family. And I didn't. <laughs> Were you scared? No. Fearless. No, no. Just fearless. 21 no. fearless. <laughs> 22. I can remember going to the the main post office in Memphis, Tennessee, and asking, there was a recruiting sergeant there, and I can still see him sitting on the high stool, and he kept saying, are you sure? Do you know what you're doing? I said, yes, just give me the application. <laughs> Once you were overseas, can you tell us where you were at? Where you, when you were overseas, where were you stationed? Crotagla, Italy. And what was your daily life like? I don't know. Got up in the morning early and went to a mission they told you to, but otherwise you stayed around the base or maybe went to town. No. Okay. And once you were in um, France, what was your daily life like? Just go to work. <laughs> and what did work entail? I was a long distance telephone operator for um, Paris military, we would call. Uh, the ones who did local calls were con called Con Z communication zone that was local and we did the long distance. We lived in a big hotel. Army buses picked us up and took us to work and brought us home. And, uh, I, the war was over in just a short while after I got there so from May until I came back in December we just enjoyed being there. Um, Mr. Friend, what was the like your most memorable experience? I guess getting shot down was probably <laughs> impressed you most of anything. Okay, can you explain what happened? I was hit by flak, uh, two direct hits on my airplane, and some others that took out everything, three engines and the oxygen system and a rudder and bomb release mechanism and things like that. It wasn't flying too good when we got hit, so finally got out. And then what? What? And then what? Then I ran into some Germans and they stuck a machine pistol in my face and I went up to North, Northern Germany as a POW. <laughs> okay, what, what happened next? I stayed at POW for eight months. Right. What was your daily life like there? Uh, kind of boring, cold, hungry all the time. But I did act as a courier for the underground newspaper, and which if you got caught with you was in solitary the rest of the war. But I never got caught with it. So living as a POW, it, it was boring? Pardon? Living as a POW, it was boring? Boring. It wasn't, you didn't do anything? Didn't do nothing, they just kept it behind the wire. Um, we didn't work because the theory was that it cost the government so much money to train pilots and bomber crews that they didn't want any of us escaping, so we, they held it behind the barber all the time. No. How were you treated? Pardon? How were you treated? How were you treated? Mostly ignored except being caught him twice a day and woke up at night to be searched, that sort of thing. Were you questioned? Oh, that was a, before I got to prison camp. That was on the road. Yeah. Yeah, I got my time in solitary for questioning. First day I got knocked around some by an upset guard. But well, we just kept moving. Do you, do you think the treatment of the soldiers, you and your comrades, was it acceptable? Yeah. It was acceptable? For me, I don't know about some of the other guys. Did you hear stories from other guys? Oh, yeah. And? Well, stories get worse as long as they tell them, but some guys were really treated badly. See, they didn't like Air Force at all, we bombed their cities all the time. And we were better off being captured by the Army than letting the civilians get us, because they killed a lot of our people when they hit the ground. When you were captured, did you hear word of what was going on on the outside? If the U.S. was winning, losing, did you get word? I thought we were going to win the war the next week when I went down. Because okay. Pat had already got to the Rhine River and then they drove him back. But a German explained to me that he, he didn't stay there that long. So. And when you were finally released, could you Biden? tell us? When you were finally released, could you tell us about that? I was overrun by Russians. And uh, we were, you might say, captive of them for 12 days. They they scared to be more than the Germans. And I made two attempts to get away, and they 
get back to the American line and I got sent back both times. Did you make any friends? Pardon? Did you make any friends? Oh, some of my closest friends. I would touch today the ones that aren't dead but in my room. And you still speak with them today? Yeah, well, there's only. I said Turing died. The only one left is uh, Bolt and uh, Lesko, which I don't see much. Most of them have died. The ones that are left. Do you talk about the war? Or is Sometimes. it something you don't you don't talk about anymore? No, I don't have any post stress syndrome. No. So, so and, we do talk about. And your that. friends have adjusted. Yeah. And it's just a war that you fought. Right. It was your duty, you know. Back then they thought that thought it was. So. You don't view yourself as a hero. Pardon? You don't view yourself as a hero. No, the hero was the guy that shot me down. I he had the skill. I didn't. You know. So serving your country. Being a POW, that duty them days, it's, just, it's just a duty. Pardon? It's just your duty. Now, I stayed in the reserve for another 20 years without pay because it was by, by duty, you know? Um, when you described your daily life, you just say it was work. Did you feel like you were in a war or it just felt like work? Well, in France, that's all you saw most of the military people. You felt like you were. Here in the States, I don't know, we were kind of resentful sometimes of civilians. <laughs> there wasn't a mean resentment, but it seemed like to me when you saw young men who weren't in uniform, you wondered why. Almost I, everybody was in uniform. I can remember going from Memphis to Des Moines when I went for active duty. There were a lot of young men on the train that were going to college and they acted kind of, I thought, snobbish. And I wondered why they weren't in the service. See, I wasn't drafted, I enlisted. That was your choice? Yes. Uh, do you think that makes a difference when you're forced or you make a choice? Uh, to me it did. It changes your attitude? Uh, well, I knew so many young men who had been drafted, I wondered why they weren't. Um, your daily life, you said that you would, um, you lived in a hotel and then they would take you? Over home. here and now, here in Fort Custer, I was stationed there longer than any other place, 20 months. Well, when you were in France? Oh, uh, we worked every day, but we only, we didn't work eight or ten hours because that telegraph system was so, well, I don't know, <laughs> it wasn't what we were used to and it was just hard for you. But we worked every day. We didn't have a day off unless something special. When I saw him, I did get the weekend off. But, uh, you know, it, it was like here. You just go into work and you came back and then it didn't feel like war? It, did, it just felt like a job? No, because by May the war was over and you, you began to see like the ones who had been in prison camp, they, of course they were, most of them were sent to Camp Lucky Strike at Lahar, France, and they would come down to Paris to see it before they came back to the States. And you would see them and then you would see, I know, friend I had gone to school with came to see me, but he didn't see me because I didn't get, because there were three companies in the hotel and I don't know what happened. He called. I probably wasn't there, but I didn't see him. And, and I, my best girlfriend was an army nurse. I saw her there in France and we came back on the same ship. And uh, you knew it was a war, but you're just glad it was over. Well, because there had been so many people over there had been over there much longer than I had been. Can you tell us about your your relationship, the two of you, how you met, and then we what knew happened each other during the war? So you knew each other before the mm -hmm. war. Mm -hmm. You weren't married before the war. Mm -hmm. No. Were you dating before the war? Oh, we go out. But not Take, engaged, or no, you were dating before. No, he—he he was a friend of my cousin, 
that I met him through the cousin. And during the war, you kept in contact a little yeah, bit? Yeah, um, he would write, and I'd write to him on my letters when he was in prison camp. He never received them because I don't know what they thought a corporal could tell him what their secrets <laughs> but he didn't get them. You opened one not long ago, didn't you? Yeah. I never read. It was sent back to me. And, well, that uh, was missing in action tell letters, but before they knew I was a captain, yeah. I thought I was dead for a long time. Do you, do you know what happened um, with your parents? Pardon? Did your parents get word that you were killed? I think Dad found out in November sometime that I was still alive. I was missing in August 29th, and then he found out. I think I was alive in November. It may have been before that. Was it? I don't know. Did they try? How did they try to get information about you when they knew that you were missing? And how did they try to get information about you? About you? Who, yeah. who, who about you, your your family. They I don't them. know what they did. You, you didn't ask them? His mother was dead. Okay. Well, the man your dad worked for tried to find yeah. out too. And they assumed they they assumed that you were dead for a couple months. I, they assumed that you were dead for a couple months. They didn't know. They just they couldn't waited. They, they just, just waited know. for work. They just waited for. They work. said waited. I miss it in action. They didn't say it was dead. No. See in action. I got uh, one medal that was given to me posthumously because they thought I was dead. Time they got around to giving out the medal and they changed it. So but my original order said uh, posthumous award. So. Um, you said that you didn't get letters because you were in. in a P you didn't get letters because you were in a POW. Camp. Oh, I got some letters. Oh, you did get some. I think I got the first one around around November. You didn't get mine. Oh, just yours. Of, uh, no, no, they have what they call a, a a special email or whatever they call it, mm -hmm. email. And uh, we could receive letters. We could even write a postcard or a letter to a month, I think, but they never got out half the time. So. Did you try to write? Pardon? Did you try to write? Oh yeah, I wrote letters. My and dad, my, I guess to, to my dad. And did you have correspondence with home? When I was overseas? Oh yes. I'd write two or three letters a week to my family and then I would hear from them. But I kept getting letters from my mother saying that they hadn't heard from him in so long. This was after VE Day. And I know I'd been writing, and then I got a letter from her, someone I heard on the radio that something had happened to me. But it was after VE Day, and I think it was Bastille Day, that's July the 14th, I think, when they celebrate. And I suppose someone got my name somewhere, and they thought they were hurting someone, you know, by doing that. Because uh, there was still a lot of untrue things on the, you know, you would, people back here would hear. And I finally went to my CO and I asked if uh, somebody could let my mother know I was all right and that, you know, I'd been writing. And my mother said, oh, oh, Red Cross worker came out to the house. Uh, from the Senatobia, Mississippi, which is the uh, county court, I mean the county seat. And my mother said when she went out on the porch, this lady said, I've got news for you, but it's good news. Because my mother knew that, she knew my mother would be upset. And then about, when they did get letters, they got about eight at one time. So they were held up somewhere. But, it was just Jeremy's way, I guess, of <laughs> trying to hurt someone. Do you remember um, VE Day? What you were doing on VE Day? VE Day? Mm -hmm. I, I think I was sitting around with some Russians or I was trying to get back to our side of the lines. And See, when the Russians over around us, it, it really caused a chaos there. You know? They run down all the fences and then they tried to have us back in and then the senior allied officer said don't go out, which we did. And we drank a little Russian rock if we could get it. And we kind of wandered around as uh, 
what they called the REFs, Recovered Allied Military Personnel. I know one, one, one attempt I made to uh, get back to the American lines was a Russian. He decided to go with us, a Russian private, I guess. Always carried a machine gun. We liberated the car in Bart, Germany. And a few miles down the road, we ran into a roadblock by some Russians with a, one of those old steam cars with a butter on the back. And the Russian gave the Russian officer a little lip, and the guy knocked him down, kicked him in the head, and his eye came out. And I thought, the hell with this. I could argue with this guy, you know. <laughs> so they gave us two miles of rifles and uh, that old car that wouldn't run. We ended up walking back four or five miles to look one. So that's as far as I got trying to get away from the Russians. So. But the interesting thing is she didn't mention it. I thought she'd be the highlight of her life, but she hasn't mentioned it. We knew each other before the war. And when I got liberated, I was taken to Camp Lucky Strike, which she mentioned, and we were called REF, Recovered Allied Military Group. Nobody knew anybody from nothing. You know, there was not much organization. There must have been 10,000 guys there. And all at once come over the loudspeaker for Lieutenant Bryan to report the Commandant's office. I said, what in the hell now, you know? I go up there and she was trying to get me on the telephone because she was a long distance operator, which didn't work. And I finally got some guys on the switchboard to connect me with you. And so I went out the back gate and went to see her the first time. Couldn't get anything to eat because everything was rationed and you know, I was illegally out. So I come back to Lucky Strike and I went to the Commandant's office and I said to the woman, I'm going to marry his friend, I'd like to have a pass. I didn't have the faintest idea we were going to be married at that time. So I went back second time to Paris on a pass, a little better. You should have mentioned that in the highlight of your service. Well, I, she didn't ask me. <laughs> so was that the highlight of your service? One of them. One of them. Yeah, I got pictures of some bunch of paratroopers and stuff, I don't know. <laughs> uh, no, I, I found out he was in a camp lucky strike, but we changed ships and one of my friends named Lucy Song. And I said, she came on, and I said, I, I found out Bruce is at Camp Lucky Strike, but I get to talk to him. We weren't as busy then because of the war. I said, if you have a chance tonight, see if you connect it. So, so we had telephones in our room, and I get back to my room, and I was, wasn't working. So I went down to the woman, Lucy's room, and she room with another friend, Skelly. Their phone, and I called a desk, and it was a French woman, and her she couldn't speak English too well. My French wasn't any better than her English, but I tried to let her know that I was at the other room, you know. And then uh, when Lucy called, <laughs> I gave she the, the French uh, operator tried to tell her, you know, she's going back. She said, "That's my room." I said, but anyway, when she and that, and she said, "Marcia, what are you doing here?" <laughs> I said. My phone doesn't work in our room. And she's well, I got Bruce on the line or something. So that was during the week, what day? I don't know. <laughs> well, Saturday morning I went down with the same friend, Skelly. We were on the fifth floor and you had to get your uh, what what they call it, you had to go the cigarettes and all that. I didn't smoke, but toothpaste and all that. Were, the PX. The PX. Yeah, well, you had to get it every week, or if you didn't, you didn't, you lose it, you know. So, of course, I didn't smoke. I didn't care whether I had cigarettes or not. But Skell and I were going down to uh, to the PX, and I got off the elevator, and I started to walk over to our bulletin uh, company where they kept all the messages and I saw this man standing at the desk with the phone in his head and he said hi Marsh <laughs> Bruce he's very thin and what was your what was your reaction when you saw him? I when I looked and he said hello Mark I, I knew right away who it was. I was just surprised seeing him and I think he was surprised seeing me. I don't know if he really knew I'd be there, but he... And I was supposed to go to work. So I went in and asked my CO. I said, the man I'm going to marry. 
Well, I, I ate with the wax for almost a week because yeah. I didn't have a pass. And, but her friends got tired of asking me into their mess hall. So. We could have, each one could have so many guests a week. And after my quota was gone, my friends would sign him up as their guests. It's interesting. They really couldn't because in the last few months in prison camp as a prisoner, we were down to 800 calories a day or less. So you couldn't even stand up without hanging on to something. And I got into France and eat all that whack food. I was eating the fire oh. and all that stuff. We had French cooks. <laughs> what were the, the 800 calories? Huh? What, the, eight, the 800 calories? What was the food? What type of food was it? Could have been a bucket of potatoes, or it could have been a bucket of cabbage, or a bucket of frozen Buda Baker, or, or barley, or once in a while a horse, and once in a while a Red Cross parcel. But now you didn't get this the same day. This was a day fraction of the time. And whatever they chose, was, whatever they chose was yeah. your food for the day. Yeah. Or had. <laughs> well, we cooked our own meals right in our room. There was 20 of us in the room about the size of this area right here. And that's where we lived. That's where we ate. That's where we cooked and everything. And some of them were more crowded than us, so it just depends on where you were. You know? From VE Day to victory in Japan, how, uh, where were you? Pardon? Where were you from uh, VE Day until the whole war was over with the victory well, I went home for. 90 days R&R, &R. they didn't know what to do after the Japs surrendered. We were scheduled to go to Japan, but then that war was over, so thank goodness we didn't have to go. I didn't want to get shot down again once is enough. So. Were they planning? They were, they were planning on sending you again? Well, they, we were all going to go. There were guys, that, I know guys from our post down there who finished up in France and were on the boat already to Japan when the war was over over there. You never knew. You know, the general says, I need so many pilots there, and some corporal types up a list, and that's where you go. <laughs> and that's what you fly. And people say, what did you fly this airplane for? Why did you fly out of Italy? That's where they sent me, you know? That's what they told me to fly. You never questioned them? In those days, you didn't question higher authority. <laughs> you said, yes sir, no sir, no excuse sir, you know? Even being a prisoner of war, Pardon? even being a prisoner of war, you still didn't question? Question who? The authority. What authority? The Germans? You think they listen to a person? No, no. F being, if you were going to be sent to Japan, you were already you served no, time. No. You were a POW. You still I just, all, all I know is that Colonel, our senior Allied officer, went to Paris and said we were all anxious to go fight the Japs, and we thought that was terrible. But that's all we do. <laughs> and what what did you do from uh, VE Day? Same thing. I kept working at the. Uh, Paris military, and uh, I got a, in October before I came home, I got a leave and went down to Nice on the Mediterranean Sea. It was a furlough. I enjoyed that. And uh, well, we just worked, but we would try to see more historical things, you know. And Did you think you might get sent? someplace else? No, because after the Japanese uh, surrendered, uh, all they want to do is to get us out. <laughs> so, you know, they were paying a lot of people to be in the service and they weren't needed anymore. And I wasn't overseas as long as uh, as long as some of them that I was stationed with, but I had been in longer, counting my WAAC time. And you, they went by a point system. You see, I was in three years, both group. And some of them were in only less, half, about half that time. Um, what's your opinion on how we ended the war in Japan? What do you mean, opinion, how we ended the war? Yeah, what do you, how do you think, or what do you think about the way we ended the war by dropping the atomic bombs? Well, Jack? Was it a, was it a good thing uh, to do, or bad, or? The war was already over by the time we dropped that. Mm -hmm. But it was a good thing to wake them up, you know. They burned out more of Tokyo with a fragment of uh, incendiary bombs than the, than the other cities were with the atomic bombs.
And same question. Do you think that was the right way to end the war? Well, <laughs> who am I to say? I'm not, <laughs> I don't study the history of wars that much and I figured there were people smarter, a lot smarter than I were. was it. The generals and everything, they knew more about it than I did, so when the President Truman was the one that ordered it, so I didn't question it. I just... But the theory is we'd have lost a lot more men if we'd have invaded it without it, so there you go. Yeah, that's true. I did. I said I didn't do nothing. I did serve a short tour as a mess officer on a troop carrier ship. It was kind of odd. Was, my buddy was a fighter pilot and I was a bomber pilot and we were way down in the troop ship coming home, or first day out of, out of uh, was it Lahar? Hmm? Where was Lucky Strike? Lahar? Or, to Lahar, France. Yeah. And this major come down on the bottom of the ship and he said, what are you two officers especially? We said, we're pilots. He said, no, you're mess officers. No questions asked, we were best officers. So we spent 7,500 men twice a day. And my assistant, did you ever hear the movie Actor Victim of a Tour? I don't think so. Have you? Some of the old movies? He was the chief petty officer on the ship, he did all the work. All I did was stand around and look important. But, uh, so I served as a best officer, I think, five days. <laughs> I learned one thing, you didn't let soldiers sit down and eat mess because they get sick and throw up on the table, so we took all the chairs out and had them stand up and eat, get the hell out of there, you know. That was my only duty after the war until I went to Kelly Field. And then I went into the Reserve Corps, I've been there up until, when did I retire from the Air Corps? The Reserve Corps. 1980? I don't know, downstairs. <laughs> all through the cold water and all that stuff. See, that burns me up because when I served in the reserve, we didn't get paid either in those days. I had a secret clearance from the FBI for secret stuff. And if you did something and I did something, if I didn't know, need to know what you were doing, I didn't find out. There was a need to know basis all day. Now all the television commentators and all the newspaper reporters, everybody's in question everybody what they're doing. I know I was assigned one time when they thought the atomic war was going to go up, it was going to last three days only, you know. We were close. A lot of civilians don't realize how close we were right here in Detroit. Well, anyway, I, I enjoyed my time in the service. It wasn't all good, it wasn't all bad. When you finally um, got out of the service, what did you do? Pardon? When you finally got out of the service, what did you well, do? I went to college to get to the, the education because you get one for free, you know. And what did you do after your time in the service? Well, we married in May of 46. And uh, he'd already was going to school at Mississippi State, and I, after we married, I went for one semester, and then I, when I was pregnant, I stopped because they didn't go to school then <laughs> when they were pregnant. So then when he finished, we came here to work. And our oldest daughter was born as. And at Mississippi State in Starkville, and the others were born here. Okay, question for both of you. Um, how do you think serving as uh, in a war and being a veteran, how has that made you the person you are today? I tell you what, it gave me a lot more opportunities than I ever had as a kid growing up during the Depression in South Dakota. Well, that'd be the same for me in Mississippi. Because Give you more opportunities. In light of events I, in today, you know, I made the friends I made mm -hmm. were about ten, and we corresponded at Christmas usually. But we all, when we married, got invitations and things like that, and I saw several of them. But now there's, and most of my friends that I kept in touch with were the ones I was stationed with out here at Fort Custer because we were together 20 months out there and then in basic training together. So over two years. So, but I only know one that's living now. And that's hard. But 
you, you made a lot of good friends. I don't care what anyone else says about it. At least back then we did. And he's kept in touch with a lot of his, like even the ones he's in the prison camp with. 20 people in one room. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You made good friends. I had a good crew as on well, my barber crew, so we thought we were the best the Italian theater. Maybe the whole war, I don't know, but we probably weren't. <laughs> but uh, we made 29 missions together against some pretty tough targets before we went down. So. I always laugh and say that I had first class transportation because when I went from Memphis to Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia, that's where I went to be inducted. I had a field application and mailed it. Then they sent me a railroad ticket and some uh, meal tickets. And I went on the Tennessean, which was really a classy train. It went from Memphis to Washington, D.C. And it was really the nicest train I ever was ever on. Because I used to talk about the ones that ran from Chicago to New York, and I rode those when I and I didn't think they were nice. And then I went overseas on the uh, Queen Mary, and I came back on uh, USS West Point, which was our biggest ship at that time. They had had, uh, it had been named uh, SS America, wasn't it? But they changed the name if they used them during the war, and it was called the West Point. So I came back on that, and I came back with my girlfriend from down from Mississippi that was a nurse. I flew my own airplane overseas on the South Atlantic route, you know, across to Africa, up through Morocco. Where's that Humphrey Boyer that made that picture? Castle Black. <laughs> then Tunisia, then to Italy. And as soon as I got overseas, I lost it. I had to take it over and fly for a while. Is there anything that I didn't ask you? I any story so. that you want to share? Any, I, is there any story that I didn't ask you that you want to share? Something that you thought I would ask and I didn't ask? Well, I, I can tell a story about Bolt. He was my squadron commander, and once he became a lead pilot, sometimes the squadron commander flew in the co-pilot seat, but as a command pilot for the whole group. When we got hit, we went down, and the bombardier lost his parachute in the explosion, and he came up pretty panicky when it came time to jump. And, Bolt was wearing a chest pack, one when you snap on, and I was wearing a backpack where it's strapped to you. So Bolt gave him his chest pack and told him to jump, and he did. I went down, I'd get out, and I, one of my navigators laying there was, I think, 30-some holes in him, and I finally got him so he could, I thought he could open the chute, we dumped him out the bomb bay, and he, he didn't open the chute open. So I go back up to Bolt, and I said, Hey, we'll hook together. You hook your harness to mine, we'll double jump on one shoot. <laughs> he said, you're a damn fool. He said, get out of here. He was a command pilot then. So, but I did. And, uh, after I'd been down, I saw this smoke coming up. Must have been five miles away. And, and uh, the bolt had crash landed at 24, a fire and everything else, and got out of it. But he couldn't get out for a while. First thing he said to me in a reunion, he said, where in the hell is the fire axe? And he, this was 20 years later. I said, how the hell do I know where the fire axe was? <laughs> I jumped out a long time ago. He had to take his pistol and shoot the window frame off to get out of the thing. Well, about 12 years ago, he gets the uh, XPLW magazine, and he, he said, I know I was in camp in the uh, same room with this guy. He said, he's John, uh, lifetime membership, was that what it was? And it had his address, it was stationed up here at, uh, well, it Greenbush. was out there, it's in Greenbush, Michigan. It was his address, but he didn't have a phone number, so Bruce wrote him a letter. And I went out shopping one day, and he came back. He said, well, that was that guy I knew. said, he called me. When Bruce wrote him a letter, he gave him our phone number. And he said, we were in the room together. Well, they belonged to an XPOW group there, and when they were, would be the host, they you know, take turns each couple having, having the, the way they did up there, and they would ask us to come up there and visit them. And we just had a nice relationship. I liked Jane, and he died in February. And we were up there last year in Octo uh, 
August. But, you know, it was sad. So. But when we got up there that first time, they hadn't seen each other in how long, about 40-something years. Yeah. And she had to, uh, someone from uh, the Oscola newspaper to come out, and they took pictures of a nice big story in there about them. <clears throat> Funny thing, you know, you talk about how you feel about the war, this what we got now. First day I was down, I was captured by a, the main guy was a German officer from the Africa Corps. He was really virtual army and he treated you just like the convention says. And his men. Next, that same afternoon he turned me over to another guy who didn't leave the convention at all. He, he's the one that boxed me around. Next day I go to Italian jail. And they was going to take me up to be interrogated with the, in an office. And I'm walking up the aisle of the jail and here comes this boat. I was talking about walking down the hall. I'm never so thankful to see somebody in my life. He was thankful to see me because he was wearing an off-colored uniform that day and the American didn't believe he was American and the Germans thought he was a plant. You know? So I go in to get interrogated. The officer was a pretty nice guy sitting there by the desk with a pistol in the desk. Right? And I, like I said, I thought the war was going to be over. Really, I didn't think it was going to last this long. So I got my courage back. He said, I want your insignia rank and your dog tags. I said, well, he was the I said, he can speak better English than me. I said, the Geneva Convention says I can keep this. And he just picked that pistol up and he said, Lieutenant, didn't you hear me? You know what, I give my dog tags. <laughs> well, you know, we didn't have television then. You didn't hear about the war like you young people have heard all about this one and even back in Vietnam. A lot more. You got your, you went to the movies, you could go to Best Theater almost for 25 cents. <laughs> and there was always uh, something on there about uh, they'd have the, the movie and then they'd always have a newsreel in a comedy or something. And it was always something about Hitler. On, uh, Nobody called President Roosevelt a liar or a cheat either like they do now about the president. And that's they where. They spent some time in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas if they had it. And you read the papers. I mean, you couldn't wait every day to get a paper to read. But really, you know, combat, you ask most guys, you really didn't know what happened in that war and you went to see the movies because you were so busy doing whatever you were supposed to do and getting shot at yourself, you didn't have the big picture. <laughs> so now you go to see the movie and they'll explain how the war went <laughs> and what you did. So do you learn more about what you did from the movies? You see the big picture of what happened? No, because half of it was BS. Oh, you think so? <laughs> Remember that movie they made about the uh, Memphis Bell? Yeah. The guy sitting up there with her thousand mission hat on and a white scarf. What a crock. You know, we had steel helmets down, pull over our eyes. We were wearing flak suits. <laughs> and we're afraid to death. It's cold up there with those old bombers. You know, I was 26 below the day I was shot down. And that was a warm day at that altitude. And the guys are saying, I thought about my girlfriend and all that. <laughs> you didn't think Anybody that stood up there in that flat and thought about his girlfriend had to be a nut. You were trying to get out of that place. <laughs> what I remember most in the movies was Hitler. Even when we were still, we both finished high school the same year, 1938. Going to the movies and Hitler, even then, he had the Heil Hitler and that goose step they did. And, and I can remember seeing a movie and then going to school and you're talking about it and it just... We grew up with that until the war started. Mr. Barney, so that's our war stories, I guess, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You said something about um, no one called Roosevelt a liar and today people do. I don't know if he did or not, but do they you, didn't well, say do you it think then. Today that but they're calling Bush a liar and stuff and, and you've been been up for uh, aid and comfort the enemy for Pete's sake 60 years ago. Do you think that's progress? That no, you can I think criticize they, your government? I think they just started the first event of the Constitution to play out of line. I think they have too many reporters over there and they aren't given accurate information sometimes. But they have retired generals on TV now criticizing the whole war and quite frankly 60 years ago they would have went to Fort Leavenworth County. Would you go on TV and criticize the war? Absolutely not. I might be against something or other, but I certainly wouldn't say it in the public. I held, I still hold a commission for Pete's sake. I still got a duty. 
I don't think they'll ever recall me from retirement. <laughs> If they do, boy, you better, young people better watch out. We're going to lose that war. <laughs> the only reporter I remember being in World War II was Ernie Powell. And he went with the soldiers. And he wrote how they lived. And then, uh, what's his name? He was in the service. Uh, you sent me his book. Who? Oh, the little guy who wrote the book. He was in the service. That book. About the war, about Willie and um, oh, Bill Malden. Bill Malden. And when I was stationed in France, the Stars and Stripes was printed right across the street from our hotel. I couldn't wait every morning to get the paper. <laughs> My girlfriend used to say, Man, she called me Maggie. She said, I can just see you when you get married. <laughs> You'll be. It won't be your husband, it'll be you reading the paper <laughs> across the table from him. But I'd get one every morning, and he always had a little cartoon in the paper. And then I, printed, you, I couldn't get it over there when he came back to the States. He sent me a bill. The way I feel about book. the war now, it's just like in book one of cold weather, no food, not much anything. And we had a guy in there named Kendall. One went off real close to his head, and he wasn't quite right. You know? And he'd walk up and down the hall and I'd say, this is a lousy damn war. Finally, the guy said, God damn it, Kendall, it's the only war we got. You know? like that. <laughs> so we just gotta stay with it. <laughs> I don't know if we got to write war or not, but I know one thing, somebody has to stop those people. You remember the old newsreel when Neville Chamberlain got out, peace in our time, and then followed six years of war, we'll never forget. You know? So. But quite frankly, I think it's a religious war. Any other uh, comments in closing? Pardon? Any other comments? No. No more? We're talking modern stuff now, and I've got no authority to say anything. I, I've never been sorry I serve. Me no. neither. No. And as I said, I wasn't made to. I did it on my own. And my mother. You might didn't like it when you joined the army. Not too much, and uh, my dad was the only one that didn't say, all my friends, are you crazy? And even one that I went to school with, and one of my girlfriends asked my dad, said, Mr. Walker, why'd you let Marjorie go in the service? He said, I didn't let her. I said, she's 21 years old, she can do what she wants to. I, I remember one time I was home on leave, and I was out in Dakota, and that's only, I forget who it was, she said, the war made a bum out of my son. I said, he was a bum before he went in there, for Pete's sake, you know. <laughs> it wasn't the war. No. No. Uh, isn't that about right, though? Sometimes they blame all this on it, And my dad had a brother that was killed in World War One, just Never about a anybody. month before armistice. And, uh, and then his older brother was in the army too. And when he came back, he was he was never very well after that. He was gas and well, war's all like said she, she had three relations in the in the Confederate army. I had three in the Union army. <laughs> <laughs> and you're still together. Yeah. So, well, come May 19th, we'll be married 60 years. Congratulations. Well, thank you but for I, your time. To tell you the truth, I kind of like the Army. The fact is I considered going over and flying with RCAF originally, and then they said they were going to start drafting us, so I enlisted their own Army. But a lot of our Americans went over there with the Royal Canadian Air Force during World War II. And most guys, drafted or not, they kind of end up enjoying the war anyway or the Army life. I don't say they enjoyed the war, but they enjoyed the Army life. There's been good times and bad. Like I said, you make good friends. So, so we've run our, run our tape out, Margie, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've learned a lot. Thank you very much for your information. Valuable, valuable knowledge. Come down. When, when we put out the paper this morning, come down. We'll, we'll tell all these stories again to the Legion all week. <laughs> well, thank you for your time. <laughs>